All right, we're in the book of Daniel, so I want to start with this, okay? And y'all look so good tonight. I'm really excited. Not you, bro. Everyone else. No, I'm just kidding. Y'all are good. Okay, so I want to tell you a story that happened. Um, we, have, uh, we have opened our home to a friend of ours that just had a baby. I, I meant to bring a picture. I forgot, but you can just look on Instagram because she sleeps on my chest like every night. It's so awesome. She just lays there. It's really funny because she lays there. She just sleeps. And I look at her mom like, why do y'all always complain? This is so easy. All she does is sleep. But see what happens is they change her, they feed her, and then they give her to me when all is good. So if you, if you don't have a baby or know anything about a baby, you, understand, you don't understand anything. But anyways, long story short, Sarah, my wife, is the oldest of seven. And so her younger brother, JR, came over the other day. And um, he came in the house, and Layla was there. Layla's a little baby. And uh, Sarah, my wife, Sarah, was like, hey, do you want to see Layla? And he was like, oh, no, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you. I'm okay. He's 10, okay? Uh, I think he's 10, something like that. No, no older than 10. And she's like, oh, okay, that's all right, no problem. So then a few minutes go by, and he comes up to her, and he goes, hey, um, could, could I see Layla now? And Sarah's like, well, yeah, of course, come on. So she brings him in so you can see. And then she's like, do you want to touch her? And he's like, oh, no, 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 that's okay, that's okay. I just, just want to look. So he's kind of looking from, like, the door frame, just kind of looking in, looking over. A couple, couple more minutes go by, and finally he comes up, and he's like, hey, do you mind, if, do, do you mind if, I, if I touch her? Like, is that okay? And she's like, yeah, come on. And so he takes his finger, and he's like, oh, she's so soft, so soft. And, and so the whole time, Sarah and, and Rachel, the baby's mom, are, are laughing. And anyways, long story short, uh, Rachel and her mom go to the store. They run off to the store. And so Sarah, Layla, and Jay are at home, and Sarah has to make a phone call for work. And so she looks at Jay, and she says, listen, Layla's on the couch. She's going to be fine. Just, just, you just stay right here and just keep an eye on her. And if anything goes wrong, just shout out. I'll be right around the corner. And he was like, okay. And so he, he literally, so imagine this is the couch. He's looking down on the couch. And she said that she left him and he, he had his hands like that. <laughs> and she came back two minutes later and he hadn't moved an inch. He was just <laughs> watching, protecting, keeping an eye. Now, why do I tell you that? Here's why. Tonight, the scripture that we're going to look at is very real. It's very intense. It's going to talk about some about the end times. It's going to talk about prophecy, big words, big things that you're not going to probably understand when we first read it until we really dig in. And what I want to tell you is like, like little JR did with even littler Layla, we're going to come the same way at the scripture tonight. We're going to be delicate. We're going to be careful. We're going to be cautious because I don't want to lead you astray. I don't want you to think that I have all the answers. I want to do my very best to begin to describe and to begin to explain these dreams and these visions that we're going to study. And so I want us to come very delicate. We're not on a mission. We're not trying to prove to the world that we understand everything because we never will. But we're going to do our very best looking at scripture and looking at history to make some sense of a very powerful but a very intimidating Daniel chapter 7. Can we do that? Yeah. Is that cool? All right. So last thing, if you're taking notes, um, I understand that lately it's been really hard to follow along because we are moving extremely fast. So I wanted to give you guys a little tip. Uh, if you're not a note taker, don't worry, just, just relax. But if you do take notes, you might want to try this. These will be the sections. This is how we're going to break it up tonight. And so you might try just write like verse 1 and 2 and then give yourself some space so you can just kind of write in different things that you feel the Lord press on your heart. Now the second thing with this comes, you will not be able to write down everything because I might as well have be wrapping up here as fast as I talk, okay? So there's no point in trying to write down every little thing that's said. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is as you're listening and as you're studying, as we're doing this tonight, as the Lord prompts you, as you think of something, you go, man, I hadn't thought about that. Wow, that's new. I didn't know that. Jot it down. And then you can go back. All of our resources are available online. It's all free. We don't get anything for it. But you can go listen. You can go rewatch the messages and dig in a little bit more. But I want you guys to be able to enjoy it. And some of you note takers, man, you get so intense that you don't even remember what I said. You're just writing down. And that's awesome. I appreciate that. I love that. But I want to help you guys. So hopefully that's a tool you can use tonight. Now, with all that being said, I just wasted seven minutes of the time that I had. Here we go. Let's get started. I hope you're excited. Okay. A couple of things. First, we have studied Daniel 1 through 6. If you haven't been here, it's okay, because it might as well just start over right now. 1 through 6 are what we call narrative chapters. They're basically the story of Daniel, the story of his interaction, the story of his friends. And so we've studied those, and we've moved real quick because they're narrative. Now we slow down a little bit. 
And we move into a prophetic portion of scripture. Daniel was a prophet. Daniel's life is 1 through 6. Daniel's prophecies are 7 through 12. And so that's where we're going. So you're going to read some stuff tonight, and you're going to be like, what in the world is going on? And we're going to make the best we can. We're going to make sense of it. But little tidbit that I want you to understand. One more thing on prophecies. Listen, guys, listen. When you hear the word prophecy, this isn't man's interpretation of the future. Men and women are not future tellers. A prophet is someone that interprets what God has already said to them. That usually translates to what God is getting ready to do in the future. And this is what's so fascinating about Daniel. We are going to be studying things that were written years and years and years ago, yet things that have already happened and things that are going to happen in the coming future. So don't be intimidated by prophecies. Think of it this way. It's the Lord speaking to men and women, particularly now Daniel, and telling them what he's going to do. Not man's vision of the future, God's vision of the future interpreted to man. Amen. Are we good? Yes. All right. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I believe we're going to call this the four beast and little horn, but I'm not sure, and you're going to understand why. In just a second. All right, Daniel 7, verse 1. We're going to go all the way through as fast as we can, and hopefully you keep up. And one day we're going to make a rap song of all these messages. It's going to be awesome, right? Okay, focus. Here we go. Chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Okay, so stop right there really quick. Remember in chapter 6, we were talking about different kings and different kingdoms, and kingdoms have already fallen, and the Medes and the Persians taken over. Here's what's happening, okay? We are going back in time, okay? We're going back to this time when King Belshazzar was in charge. Now remember, one small side note. There were two kings in charge at this point. A king named Nabonidus and a king named Belshazzar. Now Nabonidus was afraid that he was going to be killed like the kings that have gone before him. So to kind of protect himself, he married into the family and he essentially adopted in I was hoping y'all knew. All right. He adopted in Belshazzar into his family. Take better notes, people. He adopted Belshazzar into his family. And so what he did is he left Belshazzar to rule over Babylon, and he went to some foreign city, took the capital there, and he just hung out so he wouldn't get killed. Okay, just a small side note, but important for you to know. So we have gone back, all right, and we're in the middle of Daniel's time as he's serving in the king's court. So he lay in his bed, and he had these dreams and these visions dancing in his head. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. And Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven. Now, the number four here is important because we have, how many seasons do we have? Good. How many, uh, well, stop there. North, south, east, so I didn't know how, directions. I said, how many directions do we have? North, south, east, and west. Good answer. Okay, so four is, is, an, is an interesting number because it's used. It's used for seasons. It's used for direction. It's used for the four corners of the world. So he uses four. That four is helping us understand that he's talking about the earth. So he says, in my dream, I saw the vision by night. Behold, there were four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now the great sea is what he's referring to the Mediterranean Sea. This is the biggest sea that's referenced in scripture at this point and really all the way through. So he's speaking of the Mediterranean Sea. Now listen, don't worry about the history, worry about the application. The Mediterranean Sea represents the world, okay? It represents us, it's a sea. The winds represent the turmoil in the world. We can translate that to sin. When you look around the world, what do you see? Happy-go-lucky rainbows? No, we see darkness, we see devastation, not everywhere, but most places. We see turmoil. Why? Because sin has entered in. And so as God is looking down, as he's translating to Daniel, he says, I see the world, the great sea, and I see the winds, all of the sin that has taken over the world. Y'all following? Because that's only two verses in. All right, we're stirring up the great sea. And four great, when he says great here, he literally says great, great. Four great, great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another. Okay, now one small note. These are animal-like beasts. They're not animals, okay? So we're about to read the description of these. Don't think of an actual animal. He's trying to do his best to describe this crazy thing that he sees. 
By the way, a fun exercise you might want to try on your own time, try to draw what you think these might look like. It would be really funny. And then post those online on Instagram and tag us all, and it will be really funny, okay? But these are not animals, but they're animal-like. And these four beasts are going to represent the four kingdoms that ruled the earth, which we talked about back in chapter 2, okay? So here we go, a little groundwork. This is going to get exciting. Let's go. Let's pause. One more thing. This is very important. I'm sorry. I drink coffee. I know y'all hate it when I do that because I'm all over the place already. One more thing. When Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 was talking about this statue, do y'all remember the statue? There was a statue. You had the head of gold, which is Babylon, and it worked its way down. It got less and less of value. That was Nebuchadnezzar's view of the world. God was showing him in his eyes how he saw the world. Please don't miss this. How God sees the world, how God sees us, is like this ocean with four winds. God does not down, look down on the world and say everything is happy-go-lucky. In God's eyes, he sees a perfect creation that has been broken. And so the winds and the turmoil, this is God's view of the world when the statue was man's view of the world. Okay, small note, but very important. Because of sin, God does not see this place in perfect harmony. He sees the pain and the turmoil. So all the people that go, well, God doesn't understand. He's up there and word out. No, absolutely not. He sees everything and he understands. And this is his description many, many years ago about what it looks like now. Okay, now let's go. Verse four, the first, which was Babylon. This is a representation of the kingdom of Babylon. The first was like a lion and it had eagle's wings. Now, a lion is what? He's the king of the jungle, right? That's not a movie. That's for real. Lions are the king. Of, they're the top of the food chain, okay? And so he's looking at the lion. Remember Babylon. It was one of the most powerful empires. It was the top. It was the head of gold. So the lion is really powerful. And it said the lion had eagle's wings. Now, this re represents the swiftness of Babylon. When it came into conquering, it just came in and took it all, all right? So extremely powerful nation. So he said he sees this animal-like Lion with eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on its own two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. Now do y'all remember this? This was the humiliation. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled and he was made like an animal for seven years. And then God brought him back, restored him, and brought him back to his rightful place as king and then actually allowed him to do even greater things as king. So this is the first representation. This animal is the first kingdom. All right, verse five. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. Okay, this represents the ferociousness of the next kingdom, which was the Medo-Persian Empire. It was raised up on one side. So he sees this bear-like creature, but it's on one leg, okay? So this is kind of what, I don't know either, but this is kind of what I'm picturing it looks like. Now, this is important because the Medo-Persian Empire was the Medes and the Persians ruling together, but the Persians dominated in this ruling. And so that's why it's got this symbol of one leg, right? Medes and Persians, each is a leg. But the Persians really dominated. The Medes are kind of along for the ride. And so there's a description there. And it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. Now, that's kind of weird when you read that. Like, this is weird. Three ribs. Like, he ate three animals, I guess. You're exactly right. Right? They conquered. Babylon was first. But then they came and conquered Babylon. Then they captured Egypt. Then they captured Lydia. So this is a representation of the nations that they had conquered. And it was told, arise and devour much Flesh And it was a powerful nation and devoured many, many people as it came into conquest. Y'all still following? Yeah. All right. If not, I don't care. We're going to keep going. I'm just kidding. I love y'all. Verse 6. After this, I looked and behold, Daniel's speaking. He's talking about this dream. After this, I looked and behold, another like a leopard, not a leopard, like a leopard came into being. Now, this is the nation of Greece. It was the swiftest of all. Leopard is really fast, right? Have you ever seen a leopard run? It's super fast. These guys move quickly, okay? And so this is the nation of Greece, like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. Again, these are crazy creatures, right? You can't even really picture this. A leopard is fast. You put wings on a leopard, and I don't even know what it would be like. It would be insane, all right? It's going to be like moving fast and flying fast at the same time. It's going to be booking it. Now, this is important because Alexander the Great was the, was the ruler of Greece, and he conquered the world by the age of 33, fastest ever. So when he says a leopard with wings, 
he is dead right because this dude, he moved fast and they conquered so quickly by the age of 33. And the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. All right, now listen, the beast is here. It's like a leopard. It had wings and then it had four heads. Okay, try to draw this. It'd be really funny. All right, this is crazy. Now here's the representation. The four heads are his four generals. When Alexander was in charge, there were four generals that served underneath him. Each were equally powerful. Each had great standing ability with him. And so when he left, the kingdom was divided into those four generals and they went and ruled, okay? So again, I know we're moving quickly. You're like, oh, what is going on? I just want you to be able to get a small glimpse of what he's talking about here. This is so great, all right? If not, just smile and keep going. Verse seven, after this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. Now this, I'm gonna save time. This is the Roman Empire. Some, some think this may be a reference to Satan, and it very well could be, but I really strongly believe it's the Roman Empire. So we're going to save some time and just move forward on that. So this is the last kingdom. Remember, this was the feet of clay. If y'all remember, the iron and clay. This is the Roman kingdom, all right? And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. Why was it different? It had ten horns. If you remember the statue that had ten toes, now this beast has ten horns. Horns, kind of crazy. Imagine 10 horns. This is, this is wild, all right? I considered the horns, as he's looking at the horns, he considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, little horn, remember? A little horn that came, but which three of the first horns were plucked by its roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Okay, quickly, here's what happens. Prophetically speaking, the Roman Empire is going to come back in power. Not ultimate power, but they're going to come back in power. In that time of Roman Empire, there will be ten kings that will rise up. Ten monarchs that will rule inside the Roman Empire. By the way, what's happening in Europe gives us some indication how this could happen. Okay, Listen to what the LA Times wrote a few years ago. In the European economic community, we are seeing revival like the old Roman Empire. Scripture tells us clearly that the Roman Empire will begin to come into power and there will be ten kings ruling inside of it. Ten nations inside of one big nation that are ruling. And out of those ten, one will rise. And that one is a character we call the Antichrist. And when the Antichrist rules, as he's moving into power, there will be three kings that have a little bit more dominance than the rest. He will remove them from power, and upon doing so, he will become the king of the Roman Empire, and therefore begins the process of the end times when the Antichrist will come, and he will begin to rule. So there's ten horns, ten kingdoms. Out of those ten, one will rise. That one is the Antichrist. This is all part of the end times, okay? Now let's keep going. Verse 9. As I looked, thorns were placed, and the Ancient of Days, that's God, took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. Emphasis on pure. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Anytime we talk about fire and God, we're talking about judgment, okay? So his judgment was there. Verse 10. A stream of fire issued issued and came out from before him. A, a thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. It's a reference to God. It's a reference to heaven. Okay, and what we're seeing at the very end, this is so important, please don't miss this. It says, and the books were open. You need to understand that God keeps detailed accounts of every single one of us. Every single thing you do, God has written down in his book. He monitors it. And when you die or when Christ comes back, he will go to that book when you stand in front of him and he will be looking for one thing. And that one thing is a line 
possibly of blood, this is my interpretation, but a line of blood that represents that Christ has removed this man or this woman's sin. This is what we call salvation. This is what we call becoming a new creation in Christ. You have been saved. The blood of Christ has made you clean. And every one of us will stand before God. And when we stand before God and he looks in his book, that's what he'll be looking for. Does he see that stripe in your life? Have you accepted Christ to come in to make you a new person and remove your sins? Because if not, when you stand before God, you will be held accountable for everything that you've done. And there will be nothing, no Jesus, getting in the way to remove that sin or to remove those mistakes. That is the beauty of the cross. It's the beauty of what Jesus did for us. He did that so you could stand in front of God and you could be pure even when we're not. Don't miss that. God is keeping a detailed account on every one of us, but the blood of Jesus is what washes it away. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. Now he's going back to the Antichrist. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with the fire. Listen, I'm jumping ahead, but just listen. In the end, because all of you are probably freaking out on the Antichrist, the end times, God, a book, I'm freaking out, what do I do? Listen, in the end, God will come back and he will take the Antichrist and Satan, wrap them together in a little ball, my interpretation, and he will throw them on the lake of fire and they will be no more. As a Christian in Jesus Christ, you do not have to worry because he is in control. And by the way, when you point up there, it's such a terrible interpretation because you kind of kind of point like all over because he's everywhere. God is everywhere, okay? And he will win. No one, no thing, not even Satan will stand against him. He will be thrown in the lake of fire. But pretend you didn't hear that so we can talk about it again at the end. Verse 12, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away. All those empires fell, but their lives were prolonged for a season in time. I saw in the night's vision and behold with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Jesus, and he came to the ancient of days, God, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. What will happen is God is going to give Jesus our earth. He is going to say it's yours. Jesus will come back and he will take over, and once Jesus begins to rule the earth, no one will ever rule again but him. Satan will be gone, sin will be destroyed, everything will be removed, and everything will be made perfect for all of God's people. That's a promise, and God will do that. And that was that fifth kingdom we talked about a few weeks ago. When Jesus comes, God's going to hand it to him, and he will come for us. And by the way, I said this before, It will not be, it will not be some great, peaceful, loving moment. For us as believers in Christ, all who believe, it will be. But for those not in Christ, it will not. It will be dark, it will be scary, it will be brutal. Because the fire, the judgment must come. And Jesus died so that every person could be saved, but anyone that doesn't choose, they must face the judgment. I just the other day watched the, the movie Noah. Forget the biblical references. The movie was, was good. It was fine. Good movie. Not biblical, but a good movie. Have you ever seen a book that's the same as a movie? That's what I thought. Stop. All right. But when you watch Noah, you watch what it was like as the people were dying around them, as judgment was brought. Can I tell you, that's probably a very, very just small glimpse into what it will be like. It will be a glorious day for the believers in Christ. It will be the worst day ever for those not. Please don't miss that. And there's nothing you have to do except receive Jesus to make you a new person. That's it. We should stop there, but we're going to keep going. Verse 15. As for me, Daniel... My spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those, speaking of the angels, I approached an angel who stood there and, asked him, and I asked him the truth concerning all of this. 
So he told me, he says, I see this dream. In my heart, I'm troubled. I am freaking out. I, I don't know what this means. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to, to do this. And, and so he came and the angel told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts, by the way, I've already given you all this. We're just going to see it confirmed in scripture. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Then I desire to know the truth about this fourth beast. Remember, it was different. Oh, he said that. It was different from all the rest. Exceedingly terrifying with its teeth and iron and claws of bronze and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked at this, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Verse 23. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast... There shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. And as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall rise, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, against God, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and there shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. That's three and a half years. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. The angel speaks and Daniel listens and he receives like we're receiving tonight. Many, many for the first time probably hearing this this chapter, and this is his response, the last verse. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel says, I see all of this unfold in front of me and I am troubled. It's bittersweet. He thinks about those in Christ, or at this time, those that will be with God, with the Most High, and he thinks how glorious it will be that that kingdom will reign forever and ever and ever, amen? But then he thinks about those that are not with God, that will be cast in the fire into judgment for all eternity. And he says, my heart is troubled. By the way, our heart should be troubled for those that don't know Christ. You are not here to just soak up everything this world has to offer. You are here to be a light into the world, to shine Jesus into the world. And Daniel says, I see and my heart is troubled for those that do not know. And then he kept it in his heart. Now Daniel, when he received the prophecies we're going to study over the next few weeks, when he received them, he would go days at a time where he couldn't work, he couldn't eat, he couldn't do anything because he was so overwhelmed by what was being shared with him. Do you understand? God revealed to Daniel so far back then what will happen in the coming years. God revealed to Daniel how the world will begin to end. And Daniel knew that some will reign forever with the Most High and some will reign forever with Satan. This is overwhelming. And this is so important for you and I to understand. We don't need to spend years studying the end times. If you so choose, that's great. But listen, we need to have an understanding of this. We need to know that this is going to happen. We need to have as much clarity as God would allow us to have. This is so important. Now I want to leave you with two things. The first is this. I want to describe to you what the Antichrist will be like. 
This is going to be very powerful. It's going to be very overwhelming, but it's going to be very true. This is all scripture based, what I'm about to share with you, but this is what the Antichrist will look like. There are six things, I believe it's six that we're going to see. First, the Antichrist will be a political mastermind. He will subtly grow into power. The Antichrist will not come in with a devastating blow like these other empires have as they came into power. He will creep his way in and he will look like the best politician we have ever seen and he will work his way to the top and once he's established himself as in charge, then he will wreak havoc on the earth and it will get bloody and it will get devastating but he will be a political genius he will make peace with israel when peace never seemed possible and in the middle of that peace he will break it in half this is what will happen one attribute of the antichrist the second he will be an intellectual genius scripture says has eyes like a man when it says eyes it's referring to insight he will have insight. You will look at this guy and he will be the best politician and he will look like the smartest man that's ever walked the planet. He will figure out things. He will solve problems. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would look like if someone could solve the economic problems we're having right now? He's going to look like that. He's going to come in and everyone's going to go, this is amazing. Get rid of the president and everybody else bring this guy in because he's got all the answers. He will be a political mastermind. He will be an intellectual genius. He will be an oratorical genius. The scripture says, mouth speaking great things. Two times it said that in Daniel 7. When the Antichrist comes, he will speak and you will be captivated. Do you understand that our culture and technology is making this principle among others true today? The longer you and I are on social media, the longer you and I are on the internet, the less and less our interpersonal communication skills become. There will come a day when people, most likely our children or grandchildren, will have the hardest time just having a conversation amongst each other because they have lived in an internet world. We live in a world, by the way, where you can say whatever that you want on the internet but that you would never say to someone's face. And I am telling you, one way the Antichrist will come in is because for once in a blue moon, someone will come in to a bunch of people that can't even have a conversation amongst themselves. And when he speaks, he will do it with elegance and everyone will look at him and go, man, I want to follow him. We are doing this to ourselves. Don't miss that. And I'm not saying social media is terrible. I am telling you what's happening on the internet is destructive in the end times and also in our social lives right now. He will be a political mastermind. He will be an intellectual genius. He will be an oratorical genius. He will be a military genius. It says scripture, he will devour the whole earth and break it into pieces. He will rise peacefully and he will bring terror. It will be crazy. He will be a commercial genius. He will pull off economic anomalies. He will make inflation most likely, dis that's my interpretation. He'll make inflation disappear. We'll look at him and go, this is the greatest man that's ever walked the earth. He's made us rich, no more debt. This is incredible. I don't know if all that's going to happen, but you will see he will be an economical genius. He'll be a commercial genius, a military genius. And last but not least, he will be a religious genius. Scripture says he will speak words against the most high. He will try to undo everything that God has done. There is a good chance, again, me speaking, please hear this, there is a good chance that he will remove Sunday worship completely from the face of the earth. There is a good chance that he will move in a way that everyone is so captivated that they will believe that what he is doing is far better than what God has ever done. He will speak things against the Most High, and then it says he will wear down on the believers. And what it says is every person that still tries to believe in God, they will continually be worn down, worn down, beaten down, until they finally just want to give up. The Antichrist, when he comes, like these bozos we see on TV, I'm the Antichrist. No, you're not, you idiot. The Antichrist, when he comes, he will never say a word about it. 
He will move his way up and he will take control and he will rule for a certain amount of time. But then, believe it or not, that will be it. Because as soon as he comes into power, he will initiate the end. And when the end is initiated, Jesus Christ and God will begin to put the plan in motion that will come and take him and wipe him off the face of the planet and throw him into a lake of fire. And he will never rule again. But until that time, there is going to be a very dark season in this world. Now listen to me. These are interpretations pulled from Scripture, okay? Most of these things are going to come true. And this is why it's so important we understand it. He may do it in a different way. He may maneuver around. He may not get rid of inflation. He may get rid of something else. That's why I say some of these things may move, but in the end, you will see the Antichrist, and he will be in power, and he will do it peacefully, and he will make everybody love him, and he will rise up until God says that is enough. Now the question has to come, when is Jesus coming? Can't we just skip this? Can't we just skip this whole part? Can Jesus just come back, make everything good, and all be peaceful? Is that, wouldn't that be great? All right, you hear that? Okay, didn't work. That would be awesome. Now let me tell you, I don't have the date, the time, the month, the year. I don't have any of that. And anyone who tells you they do, just get away from them because they're probably getting struck by lightning. All right, no one knows. No one knows when Christ comes back, but here's what we do know. These are the things that will happen. It's what the scripture tells us. One, there will be four kingdoms that will rule the earth. We've already seen that, okay? Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, Greece, and the Romans, they've already ruled. They've already been taken out. And then the Antichrist will come, and then his persecution will come. And then after that, when he's been wiped off the face of the planet, when the final judgment has come, then Christ will return. We don't know the day, we don't know the time, we don't know the hour, but we do know this, as we look around the world, we begin to see things in motion that lead us to believe that time is coming. Now, now the last thing. Listen carefully. Do not get so caught up in the end times that you miss living in the now. It's okay to study this. And some of you are going to want to know more. Some of you are like, don't ever talk about that again. I'm done. I got what I needed. <laughs> Either way, listen. Don't get so caught up in what's coming that you miss what's happening right now. You've been placed on this earth to be a vessel, a tool for God to live for him, to do ministry, to point people to Jesus. Don't miss that, okay? Don't miss that. But on the other hand, don't get so caught in the now that you lose perspective of the end that is coming. Some of us have fallen so in love with this world that we kind of hope he won't come back for a little bit longer. We may never say that, but that's the kind of life we're living. Listen, guys. We've got to be careful here. We keep the end in mind so we're motivated to live a life for Christ. You've been given an opportunity. And listen, Satan is going to do anything he can to destroy this, to mess this up. I'll use a real life example happening right now. What's happening in Ferguson. Okay, listen. We're, I'm saddened by that. This is not about what did or didn't happen. I'm so I, When anyone, when someone is killed, I'm always saddened. I'm never belittling that. But I want you to see what's happening. Satan is using that moment to turn us against each other, to cause hatred to come back in, to cause fighting to come back in. All this picketing, all of this, all the lies, all the nonsense. This is Satan working together to bring the people against each other so we would lose focus on what really matters. When we're focused, eyes on God, eyes on Christ, we don't miss this. We are focused because we know that he's coming. And as long as I walk the earth, I want as many people to know that too so that they could not be thrown in the lake of fire, but they could walk with me into eternity with God Almighty forever. That's what I want. That's what you should want. That's what God wants from us. When you become a Christian, your life has been initiated. You now walk in the Great Commission. You now are called to share the love of Christ with as many people as possible. And you'll do it differently. Some will be through a job. Some will be through your service. Some will be just witnessing and walking and talking with people. There will be a multitude of ways, but all of us have been called to the same thing. We have been called to share the love of Christ. Listen, 
when you receive Christ into your heart and you commit your life to walk with him and to share him with as many people as possible, then you will be ready for the return of Christ. That's what we're striving for. That's what we're living for. If you don't know Jesus, tonight could be your night. Start with him. Get your page in the book blotted out by Christ. Never to worry again. And then you take that life and you give it to the Lord and you live for him and you do it through your job and you do it through your education and all the things you begin, but you do it for him with your eyes focused on what matters, knowing that he's coming back, knowing that the end will come, not so focused on it that you miss the now, but not so focused on the now that you miss that he's coming. That's what he's calling from us. That's what I'm calling from you. I pray tonight gave us just a little bit more understanding of what Daniel was speaking of, a little bit more understanding of the end times. We can't know it all, we never will, but we can have some great insight so we can better understand what's coming. Do this, receive Christ, live for Christ, share Christ, and you'll be ready for the return of Christ.